Captain. We're going to enter the beige belt. Rather abruptly, I would think. As composers, we spend our time thinking about melodies, harmonies and rhythms. But if that's all we think about, there's a good chance our music will end up being beige. We'll enter an area of musical space that all the best composers avoid hanging out in for anything but the briefest amount of time. The dreaded and deadly beige belt. It's getting terribly beige, Captain! So what is the beige belt? Well, imagine you're a beginner writing your first ever piano composition. Your mind is focused on writing a good tune and which chords to use with it. You're quite proud of it, but what you don't realise is that for the whole piece, your left hand hasn't really moved outside of a few notes below middle C, and your right hand did the same just a bit higher up. Both hands stick in the middle register and stay there for the entire piece. They're the most obvious, familiar colours, and very quickly the texture starts to dull. Things start to feel monotonous and bland. You've found yourself in the beige belt. Now, back when I was a rookie composing cadet, that word register was thrown around quite a lot as a thing that would be good to try and control. But it took me a long time to wrap my head around what that meant and how to use register to avoid the beige belt. So let's try and unpack it. What we're talking about is musical space. And if you look at a piano, it does a pretty good job of representing almost the entire musical universe available to us as composers, the complete cosmos of composition. The area from the top note of the piccolo to the bottom note of the tuba. Our beginner piano piece was stuck somewhere around here, but we're not simply saying it's that area that's the beige belt. It's a bit more subtle than that. So what we need is a set of guidelines to help us navigate this space. And to get us started, let's look at exhibit one, a bagatelle by Beethoven, which is a great example of one of the easiest ways to avoid the beige belt, which is simply to keep things moving, to never get caught napping in one musical space for too long. Beethoven opens up with an arpeggio which outlines most of the space he'll be using. That's followed by an upper register run and a series of chords leading back down again. If we convert the notes of this piece to a midi roll, we can see what's happening more clearly. After a repeat of the opening idea, we move firmly to the middle register for a little while. But notice these high solo moments which clear the register like a sharp pulsar of light. The up and down motion of the beginning is repeated and we then move to a second section and look how low down it goes, middle and lower registers. And it stays down here for a while. There's an interesting gap here with arpeggios in the upper and lower registers, but nothing in between. That gap is then filled in with a big scale down back to the opening arpeggio. So throughout this piece, the notes never stay in one register for very long at all. Beethoven keeps things fresh and unbeige by always keeping things on the move. So that gives you an overall flavour of how register works, but I think now we need to zoom in and look in more detail at a specific example so you can see what a real difference changing the register can make. And for this guideline we'll say, make sure you make clear registral shifts. It's a piece called Un Bach sous l'Océan by Ravel, and in fact I'm going to be a bit mean to Ravel and play a version of this piece that I've rewritten so that it ends up in the beige belt. Okay, so it starts off nicely and interestingly in the upper middle register with the F sharp below middle C being the lowest note. Ravel's deliberately left out the bass so that it can make an impact in the next chord. But that's the chord that I've rewritten here and kept it in the same register. You can hear the change of harmony here, which is very nice, but certainly by the time the main chords return, it's starting to feel a bit beige. So here's Ravel's actual version. The first arpeggio is the same as before. These chords are now an octave lower, and wow, they make such a powerful, actually an emotional impact, I think. And then listen to how chill-inducing the return to the higher register feels.
It's an example of how making very clear registral shifts can make a big impact. And there's a third guideline that we can see here, which is that you can make things more impactful if you clear the space out before them. Those of you who are into electronic music production will have heard about how it's important to give things space in the audio spectrum to clear out certain registers so that they don't clash with the voice, for example. Well, this takes things a stage further. Clear the area out in advance, make some space in the preceding music, and then when that register is suddenly filled, it will feel much more satisfying. So here in the bar preceding the return of the chord, Ravel clears out even the middle register, just leaving a bit of a rumble down in the bass. The effect of the return to the higher register then feels like the sun is coming back out from behind a cloud. Probably the best known trick with register like this is withholding the bass for a while. So first verse without the bass and second verse bring it in. No matter how well worn this trick is, it somehow never fails to be satisfying. I'm sure you can all think of examples of that. So let me show you the same effect, but in reverse. So you know that feeling when there's a steady thrum from a spaceship that's parked in the docking bay next to you, or the constant background beeping of the control console. You don't really notice them until you turn them off. Well, you can do the same kind of thing in music, as long as you don't make that constant sound too annoying. Here's an example from one of my favourite operas by one of my favourite composers, Janacek and his Katya Kabanova. It's a charming song sung by two lovers out secretly late at night. For a while in the music, there's been long-held notes in the bass. Not sinister, but a bit like the calmness of a still evening. As I say, it doesn't particularly draw attention to itself. You don't really think about it. You're listening to the melody, but it's there sort of gently clouding over the atmosphere. And that makes for a rather stunning effect when it finally clears. The song continues, but it's very close to a sensation of a weight being lifted from our minds. So far we're only talking about the simplest ways of avoiding the beige belt by thinking of register in terms of big, bold blocks of space. But the real musical universe is a bit more subtle and here's where I think it would be helpful to think about things in terms of saturation. And what I mean by that is that you can use a register of musical space in a way that doesn't completely fill it with notes. It's only a saturation of notes that starts to become tiring. Short chords in the bass, like these, use the bass register but don't saturate it. Whereas this fast run of loud notes does. If you kept this going for longer, it would pretty quickly start to feel oversaturated. And volume is another factor here. Take this example from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. As the build-up begins, notes creep in in the bass, but they barely register because they're so quiet. It's only when they fully sound out at the climax that we have a true sense that there's some significant bass action. The key guideline here is whatever register you're occupying, short notes or passages that only stay in a register for a brief amount of time, or notes that are very quiet, will tend not to oversaturate a register and allow you to keep using it for longer. So it's a question really of balance and instinct. Sometimes you might want to avoid using a register altogether, other times you might only want to avoid overusing it. Okay, let's come back now to our cosmos of composition. So far, we've only talked about the overall use of register a composition has. But of course, individual instruments only occupy their own smaller niche within this wider universe, their own subset of the overall space. And that gives them their own individual sense of high and low. You might be tempted to think that the notes are the same whatever the instrument, that a D5 is always a D5. That's not always the case. The same note will feel like a very different register on different instruments, depending on where it sits within the instrument's range. Let's take as an example the famous opening from Stravinsky's Rite of Spring.
Stravinsky deliberately chose to write very high up in the bassoon's range to give a haunted, otherworldly sound. But the exact same pitches have a very different feeling on different instruments. I asked some of you crew members on this ship to give me some examples of what it sounds like on your instrument, and you can hear it feels very different on an accordion compared to a French horn compared to a guitar all playing exactly the same notes. The wonderful Sarah Jeffrey even played it for me on three different recorders, but again, all using the same sounding pitch. You can hear how the tone changes and the obvious strain on the tenor recorder as it's way higher in the instrument's range than on the descant. Part of the reason it sounds higher on lower instruments is because of this sense of difficulty. But this in itself has caused problems because as the Rite of Spring gradually became a standard part of the repertoire and probably the most famous high bassoon solo of all time, bassoonists practiced it and improved. So much so that for today's bassoonists it's not really so extreme anymore. There was one suggestion that the solo should be transposed up a half step every decade or so to keep the same sense of extremity that Stravinsky desired. And there may be some truth to that, judging by a performance I came across by Christian Roernes, where he jokingly pretends he accidentally misread the score and plays it an octave higher than Stravinsky wrote. So the point is, the sense of height depends not just on the actual pitch, but on where it sits within the instrument's range, and even on the technical abilities of the performer. And I think that gives you a sense of just how nebulous and how difficult to avoid the beige belt really is. You might find yourself in a high space in terms of the overall composition, but in the boring middle ground of a specific instrument. Or you might find yourself right at the top of an instrument's range, but overall the piece hasn't really moved from the same middle area. So you've effectively got two ways that a passage might come across as beige, within the overall context of the piece, and within the specifics of the instrument that's actually playing. And one more little word of caution if I might stroke my chin for a moment. We may have more choices than ever with performers who can play higher and lower than ever before. But remember, the beige belt can be found in extremes as well. You only have to think of the countless number of pieces of contemporary classical music that use extremes from start to finish, but end up sounding the colour of a bland biscuit. Let's have one last example which summarises all these different ways of using register in one wonderful little piece by Georgi Ligeti, the third movement from his Six Bagatelles for Wind Quartet. And to help us I'm using animations by Stephen Malinowski, whose YouTube channel is a great resource if you're interested in visualising the use of register in pieces of music. In the already very restricted register of the Wind Quintet, and using a very simple repetitive melody and accompaniment, Ligeti gives a masterclass in how to keep the register moving and navigate us through all the different colours of the rainbow except for beige. Towards the end of the piece, the melody and the accompaniment overlap, so that in terms of the overall register, Everything is in the middle, but it's an incredibly colourful middle because the horn and bassoon duet way up at the top of their register. It's an example of how you can visit a really fascinating region in space, even though all of the actual notes are from right bang in the middle of our musical cosmos. There's no denying that navigating musical space is a tricky game. They don't just let any old fool be a captain, you know. All I can say is it takes a lot of observing the terrain to see how it behaves in different conditions, a lot of awareness of potential obstacles ahead, and above all, a reliance on instinct to steer a safe course around the barbaric, the barbaric banality, banality of beige. beige. Remember, the musical universe is vast, and it's up to each of us to explore it. So keep seeking, keep questioning, and always boldly go where your curiosity leads you. David Bruce Composer, out.